Good morning. It's good to see you all. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board, which we call the Collaborative, and now you know why. That's a lot to say, right? And it's not a really good um, acronym either. So. so anyway, to understand the Collaborative, you have to kind of go back in time. You have to go back way, way back to 2014. Seems like a long time ago, right? Ohio State was just about to win a national championship. <laughs> so a lot has changed, right? But back in 2014, uh, it was a difficult year. It was a very difficult year in the area of community police relations. And we saw things happen all across the country, and we saw a couple of events happen here in Ohio. Um, the first of which was John Crawford III. He was shopping at a, a Walmart in Beaver Creek, Ohio, and uh, ultimately he lost his life. And then the second one was Tamir Rice, and Tamir Rice was a 12-year-old boy who was playing with a, a toy gun in a park, and ultimately he lost his life as well. And so as a result of that, a number of people went to the governor and they said that, you know, we should try to do something because what we had seen was in other places around the country, there had been riots and we'd seen loss of property, people injured and the type of thing that you really don't ever want to see or ever have to deal with. And so the idea was to try to get ahead of things here, but at the same time to see if there was something that we could do about this issue the issue of the relationship between law enforcement and communities. And I think at times we kind of avoid these types of discussions because they're difficult and they involve a lot of things that we're not always comfortable talking about. Uh, they involve issues of race. They involve history. Um, sometimes looking at ourselves in a way that maybe we don't always want to look at ourselves. And so it was one of those things that was really, really important for us to do. And so I, I was just sitting in my office thinking the world was just as normal as it would ever be, focusing on the whole full-time job I had before that. And I got a call from my boss, John Bourne, and he said, hey, Carlton, I just had a conversation with the governor. I think things are going to change a little bit at OCJS. Well, cha things changed a lot. And we went on this enormous, amazing journey through the collaborative, or actually through the task force, through the collaborative, and it's been one of the most rewarding things I've ever had an opportunity to be a part of. So basically what the governor decided to do was to create a 24-member task force whose responsibility was to try to find out if there are best practices that we could implement to help improve that important relationship between law enforcement and communities. He put together a very diverse group of people to listen, and I mean listen, to listen to concerns, thoughts, ideas, whatever people wanted to talk about related to that topic. And so we were charged with, with going out and holding four public meetings. And so we had to have all this wrapped up. If you know the governor, there's no time to dilly-dally, right? You got to get stuff done. And so we had to hold these four public meetings, and then we had to write this report. And we had a few months to do all of that. Justice Stratton was one of the members of our task force. And actually, we would have a conversation like once a month or something like that, and we'd go over what was going on, and she would provide uh, input to us along with uh, Governor Voinovich as well. Um, and they were both incredibly helpful uh, in, our, in our efforts. And so we did that. We held the four public meetings. We went to Cleveland, Toledo. We went to Central State University, and we also went to the University of Cincinnati. And we listened. And the thing that I tried to do, I was not actually a member of the task force. I was just the facilitator for the task force. So we would hold these public meetings and people could come and they could share their thoughts or ask questions or whatever the case may be. And I decided that 
for a lot of people, this was going to be therapeutic for them. It was going to be for them the first time in their lives where they felt like they were going to have an opportunity to share their experience and to have someone listen to what they had to say and to try to do something about it. And so I made a very conscious effort to, um, to take my devices and leave them, <laughs> leave them be. You ever have that experience where you're talking to someone and they're like this, like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I have that, I have that uh, experience so much that you can actually, and this has nothing to do with my presentation, but you can actually lose yourself and think to yourself, well, I could say almost anything right now, and they would never know, right? So, but I wanted to make sure that people didn't feel that way, that they felt like we were actually there to listen to them, and we were. And I think probably it frustrated some people because they wanted answers right in that moment. They didn't want to just listen. They wanted to ask questions and have us solve the problem right then and there. So we held the four public meetings and they were, the public meetings were outstanding. They were very well attended. And um, I think, did Mike leave? Mike Woody, did he leave? He presented in Toledo. And I thought Toledo was, was an outstanding meeting. We had a lot of law enforcement actually came. The chief came and a few other people of, um, who have been involved in law enforcement in the, in the Toledo area. And it was a really, really good, really good meeting. And, you know, one of the most interesting comments I heard through this entire thing was a young man in Toledo. And he got up and he said, he was talking about the whole stop snitching campaign. I, I'm sure you, many of you are familiar with that, this idea that in the community you don't tell on other community people to the police. And he was talking about how foolish it was and how short-sighted it was. But he made an interesting analogy that I had never ever thought about. You know what he said? He said, you know, the police don't tell on each other either. I never heard anyone phrase that idea, those two kind of things that you would never put together uh, in such a way. And it was a very interesting way that he did that. And so um, we, we came back from those meetings. We had to write a report. And by we, I mean me. Um, <laughs> and so it's kind of like when my wife says, you know, we really need to cut the grass. And we really need to take out the trash. And we really need to, she also means me. And so, no, my staff helped me. Lisa Schoff wrote a lot of it, too. I know many of you know Lisa. Um, and so it was about a 600-page report. Um, it gets longer every time I tell this story. It was 50 when I started, right? Now we're up to about 600 pages. There's a lot of exhibits in this report. But it was a lot of hard work. We ended up with around 180 recommendations. And those were a combination of recommendations from the public and from our task force members. And there were a number of ways that you could provide recommendations to us. You could come to the meetings and you could supply them. You could send them um, through social media, actually. And um, we had a number of people do that. And then, of course, the task force members, they submitted their own recommendations. And I want to talk a little bit about that task force. The task force was made up of a, it was a very diverse group. Uh, we had people who had toiled in this for their entire careers. We had people who, this was the first conversation they'd ever had or the first time they ever thought about law enforcement or community issues or anything like that. Um, we had people who had worked on the original. It was actually interesting. We had uh, Representative Reese from Cincinnati and um, Pastor Lynch from Cincinnati who had worked on opposite sides during the initial collaborative agreement in Cincinnati all those years ago. And so all these folks came together and came up with this, um, this group of recommendations. And so once we finished with the, with the um, report, which we were really excited about, it was a lot of work, we got done with the report, we sent it over to, because it was a report to the governor, we sent it over to the governor. The governor had this huge press conference to announce what he was going to do after that. I mean, I've never seen so many cameras um, in one place. I mean, he sat at this table, and some of us were sitting behind him, and there were cameras everywhere. 
And, you know, we'd done a lot of work. I thought we were going to get a break for a little bit. It didn't work out that way because the governor created what is now the collaborative. And the purpose of the collaborative is to really bring life to those recommendations that were contained in the report. So our charge at that point was to help the collaborative come up with standards. And this is the thing that I think was most surprising to a lot of members of our task force. We have standards in our state if you want to be a police officer. There are standards, there are requirements, there's training. And every year, new training comes out through our uh, continuing police uh, training. Um, new training comes out every year that people have to take. And actually, the Attorney General gets to decide what certain hours of the, that training will look like. But if you want to be a law enforcement agency, what are you required to do? You know, we actually have one state law on required policy for law enforcement agencies. Anyone know what it is? You can't guess, Chief. I know you know what it is. Anyone else? It's a pursuit policy. We don't tell you what it looks like, what it has to contain. We don't say any of those things. You just have to have one. And having worked with a whole bunch of people to try to come up with the standards, I think I know how that happened. <laughs> I think they probably got in a room and they tried to come up with something they couldn't, and finally they just said, you know what, everyone just has to do it. And so the governor signed that executive order creating the collaborative, and he laid out two standards, hiring and recruitment and use of force, including deadly force. And I always tell people, I don't care what you're doing. I think the hiring and recruitment standard is the most important one. And it, I think it doesn't matter if you're talking about a policing agency, if you're, talking about, if you're talking about the court, if you're talking about CIT, whatever you do, if you don't have the right people doing whatever it is you're charged with doing, a lot of the other stuff does not matter. It doesn't matter at all. And so they're all important. I think that's the most important one. And if you kind of go back and trace, at least in the one in the Tamir Rice case, you see how important hiring and recruitment actually is. So the one thing I want to say about all of this, you know, we were charged with coming up with ways to improve the relationship. And I want to stress this word between some law enforcement agencies, and some communities. This should never be seen as an indictment on all law enforcement. It should never be seen even as an indictment on those law enforcement agencies who are struggling to improve that relationship. There are agencies in this state who have done some amazing things long before the Tamir Rice case, long before the, uh, the John Crawford case, because it's a, it is the right way to police. It makes things much easier when you have a good relationship. And so if anyone says, hey, this is a thing because the state is down on policing agencies, they have no idea what they're talking about, okay? Because I've seen it. And I think it's probably one of the reasons I was picked to do this is because I've worked with law enforcement my entire professional career, and I've seen them do some incredibly amazing things. But it's also a really hard job, and not everyone is meant to do this. And I think law enforcement should take pride in the fact that if you're doing this the right way, it means you're a pretty special person to be able to do this. I can tell you, I couldn't do it. You know, we had at one of our meetings, the AG's office brought out their, um, what's the thing called where you go through? Oh, the simulator, so the shooting simulator. And it's pretty amazing. Now, of course, none of us have been through the training, right? But if we had to go through it, we'd have a long way to go, because I think we shot everybody. I mean, if anything <laughs> moved, we shot it, okay? I think I turned around, I shot John Bourne. He was just standing there. Um, I'm sure it was an accident. <laughs> so anyway, so we, we get done with that piece. So we have to start the collaborative meetings. Of course, I said earlier, the governor 
Uh, there's no time to dilly-dally. So he gave us, this, uh, I think it was 90 days from the naming of the collaborative to pass the first two standards. And creating the standards, every standard has four elements to it. It has to have a policy. You have to publish it to your people. It has to, um, they have to, your people have to be able to show that they understand the policy. And then the most important one, and the one that we see in some of the consent decrees and collaborative agreements and things like that, when people step outside of policy, you have to take action. And that is one of the most natural things that we all recognize. I'm sure I've got supervisors and managers in here. I know. So what happens if one day you just stop enforcing all the rules? You don't have any rules, right? And there are some people who, they will always do the right thing. It does not matter. You could actually tell, them, and Lisa shows one of them. I could tell Lisa, you don't have to follow the rules. She'd still follow the rules. There are also a group of people who, they will go the way their, their leadership goes, okay? If leadership says it's okay not to follow rules, they're not gonna follow the rules. And so that's one of the most important, if not the most important element. Now, once you create the standards, you want agencies to adopt them. And it was completely voluntary. And that was an intentional decision that it be voluntary. Um, because we wanted people to decide that this was something that was right for their agencies. It was right for their organization. And so we had a number of agencies um, who right away, I mean, we started on, I think it was February 16th, 2016, and we actually had applications before that. I don't know where these applications came from because we hadn't even put the template out. But some people, <laughs> I mean, some people were really, really eager. And so, but the hard thing for us and the thing that we were really charged with at OCJS is we had to come up with a certification process. So it wasn't enough for someone just to say, hey, I'm in compliance. We had to come up with a way to figure out how to make sure all these agencies are adopting the standards and implementing the standards. And I want to tell you, we have... Um, we recognized right away we could not do this by ourselves. And not only could we not do it by ourselves, uh, we needed a partner who could help us, but we also needed partners who could bring legitimacy to what we're doing. Because if you go back to that time, to 2015, 2014, 2015, I can tell you from working with law enforcement, um, they felt like they were being blamed for everything that no one had their back, that everything was their fault, that every use of force was illegitimate, that every police officer was really just a racist cop who wanted to shoot black people. That's what the message, that's what I heard from them. That's what they felt. And so when something new came along and it was another thing that they had to do, what do you think their initial response? Oh, this is another thing. It's another thing blaming us. And so we needed help both to get the certification process done, but we also needed help to bring legitimacy to our process. And so we worked with the Chiefs of Police Association and the Buckeye State Sheriff's Association, and they have been tremendous partners. The progress that we have made in this regard could not have been made without them, and they have been incredible partners. And um, they have improved our process over time. So once the standards are created and we have the certification process, we come up with a, a two-pronged process. I'll, I'll let Ed talk a little bit more about the, about the inner workings of the process, but basically it has two steps to it. One is a self-certification, and that is where when the agency or when the collaborative adopts standards, we create a template of what we call proofs, and they have to, basically, it's the way that an agency can demonstrate that they're in compliance with the standards. So the self-certification is really the agency's assessment of themselves. Um, and then the second part, and that's the part our partners go out and do for us, and we have some people on staff, Ed does them himself, is an on-site review. 
So they actually go out and they look at the information that's been submitted by the law enforcement agency. They interview some people while they're out there and talk to them a little bit about it. And, and then once they finalize that, they decided they wanted to have one person who would read every single certification that's submitted. One person who would read all the reports. Um, I always say it's one person to blame if something goes wrong. Now, fortunately, it's me. <laughs> but it's been an incredible learning experience as I've watched agencies try to go through the process. I want to tell you, I think probably people are surprised to know this. There are agencies in this state without a single written policy. And, and not small ones either. You know, I think very often people think, oh, these, these are issues that happen in really small, really poor, really rural communities who just don't have the resources. No, there are large metropolitan agencies who did not have a single written policy. I want you to think about your jobs. Now, think about a law enforcement officer. Think about being brand new. You just got out of the academy. You're all excited to be a police officer. You get your job, you go to your agency, and they're like, here's your, here's your badge and your gun. We'll see you at the end of the day. How fair is that to that person? How fair is that to the people they're policing? That is not a situation that we ought to put any officer or any community in. And because of the collaborative and because of the work of our partners, a lot of those agencies now have written policies in place. And so that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of about the work of the collaborative. Hi, my name is Ed Burkhammer. Um, I know some of you in the room, I got to catch some of the CIT presentation. I was a CIT trainer, big fan of CIT. I was CIT officer of the year in 2011. He always says that. I'm proud of it, but thank you. No. So, so if you ever need an advocate, a voice for someone in your community, talked about CIT. I'm the guy. I trained everything in law enforcement, and I truly believe CIT is one of the best skills we ever learned as cops. And it trans it transgresses across crisis intervention. It's everything that cops do every day. So remember that. But anyway. Um, so as Carlton said, I retired from law enforcement. I did 28 years. And I did everything from road patrol to homicide investigations. I was a trainer, obviously. And uh, I came to work for Carlton about a year and a half ago and uh, was introduced to the collaborative. So some of my background is, besides the police department, my entire adult life has been military police and police. So I believe in standards. I believe in policies. Um, Carlton kind of mentioned it, but once again, now 30 years in, uh, government service work with law enforcement, this is the most important thing I've ever got to do. It is so important. It is far-reaching, and it is something that has to be done. Ohio leads the way so many times in so many things, and we're going to lead the way in this, in standardizing police departments. We're unique in Ohio because we have roughly 900 law enforcement agencies. Does everybody know that? Is that common knowledge for people in the community? 900. We have 88 counties. Figure that up. Do the math in your head. 88 counties, roughly 900 law enforcement agencies. All right? So um, a couple of months ago, we got to present to, I think it was 32 state representatives and 13 or 14 provinces from Canada. And we were talking about, I was talking about these numbers. So I was saying, when we create a policy, when we create a standard, we have to meet one-person police agencies to Cincinnati PD with 1,100 and some odd officers, to Akron PD, to Columbus PD, to Urbana PD with 24 officers, right? That standard still has to meet all those things. And so when we were presenting on that, after, the, after it was over, all these folks from Canada approached us, and they were like, you have, you have 900 law enforcement agencies in Ohio? I said, yeah, I, said, I, I don't know if that's pretty standard across the country, but I've traveled this country. It's pretty standard, right? Every little town you go to has a, has a police department, right? 
So the entire country of Canada, you guys have all seen a map. It's a big land mass north of us. 220. The entire country. We have 900 in Ohio in this little part of the, the 50. <laughs> right? So as you can see, so, so what that means is, and a lot of you who have trained and worked around Commander Bowling's over here, he, he knows if you work with these other agencies, you know that your agency has a standard and their agency has a standard. Our borders go together, right? Our police officers have to work together at times. They have to do things together. What if they have different policies? What if they're opposing policies? We have problems, right? On the flip side of that, we always have to think about how we serve our citizens. So if you are an Ohio citizen, an American citizen, it doesn't matter. If you're traveling across this great state, you go to a Cincinnati Reds game in the summertime, and you're driving back to Cleveland, how many law enforcement agencies and how many policies do you have to be governed under as a citizen? So we need standardization. We don't want to try to tell everyone everything they can do. Carlton also mentioned being a police officer is a very hard job. It is... It is uh, Extremely challenging. I can't believe the things I had to know just to go out and drive a police car around town. And then, as you progress in your career, the things you have to know with case law, with how to communicate uh, in court, um, court decisions that change your job. Just when you learn how to do your job, there's a court decision that comes out and it changes how you do your job, right? So for me, going back to the Army, I loved standardization. Everything was standard operating procedure. Every day, I knew how to do exactly what I was supposed to do every single day in the Army because there was, a, there was a policy for everything. So I go back to when I was hired. I get out of the Army. I come back to Ohio. I take one police test. I get hired. Great. I'm a policeman. I went to work my first day. I went to the police academy. I came back. I go to work my first day, and I was looking through every piece of paper the police agency gave me because I need to put my uniform together. And I'm looking for standard operating procedure. I had my ruler out. I had my quarters. Because in the military, that's what you do. Quarters and a ruler to get everything perfect. I put it where I thought it went to the best of my ability. Then I went to work. So I went to work eight hours early because I was excited about my job. <laughs> and I looked for anyone to tell me where can I find the policy on uniforms. And so I got to talk to three guys. They were all senior guys as they, come in, they were coming in and out of the police department. And they all said, the first guy said, shut up, rookie. I was like, okay. That was the great sergeant that I had to work for. The second one said, I ain't got time to, he goes, just put it, put it together. Just wear it. Nobody cares. The third guy come in. His name was Ricky Locke. And Ricky said, you're in the Army, weren't you? Because I was standing there like this. I'm measuring. He said, you're in the Army. He goes, all right, me too. So he helped me. So I realized real quick, we have no uniform policy. Kind of worried me, kind of worried me. So gratefully, as I stayed at the department within about five years, we went through CALEA. Everybody know what CALEA is? It's a nationally accredited law enforcement agency certification program. It's, it's amazing if you can do it. Uh, I believe it's over 400 standards now. So my department improved dramatically with these standards. We in the collaborative will never meet 400 standards. What we want to do is try to standardize specific, very important topics that we can go statewide and do. So Carlton talked about it. We're right now at five standards. We're getting ready to release our sixth standard. Um, so we have use of force, including deadly force, recruitment, hiring, community engagement, telecommunicator training, um, and body-worn camera. And bias-free is our next standard. So some examples. And I want you to all take this back. Every one of you has a connection to a law enforcement agency somewhere. Take back the thought that something as simple as how to record citizen activity needs to be written down somewhere. Someone owns the data, right? Somewhere there's a public records law that says you have to follow it. When, does your, when do you own the data and when do you not as the agency? When is it the officer's proprietary uh, property? 
right? These are all questions that you have to ask when you do things like this. So you think about that. And as law enforcement, we probably, they probably all do that with their cars. They probably do it with their handguns and all their, their Batman belt equipment, right? There's probably somewhere in the policy that says the agency owns it. And if you leave tomorrow, we get to keep our stuff. So it has to be covered with body-worn cameras. And we have to think, in the, and we're in, the, we're in the 21st century, it's 2017. Everything's data. There's stuff on the cloud, right? Just think about things like that. But these are important standards. So for 2018, we're going to have the bias-free policing standard. Once again, that's the, those are the, some of the words that police departments hate. We're automatically pointing fingers at police, telling them they're all doing something wrong. They're not all doing something wrong. The vast majority of them are doing great, great, great things in, in, in Ohio and in this country. But some are not. What I found of doing this for over a year now is there's a lot of agencies who need our help. No one's ever gone to them from the state or from any other uh, agency or group and said, can we help you write a standard? Keep in mind some of these chiefs, I just met a chief at, during this process a few months ago. He's 30 years old. Not saying anything about his age. I'm just telling you as a 30-year-old police officer, I didn't know a, I knew a lot. I didn't know enough to be a chief at 30 years old. Then I found out that he was actually a police officer for six months. The chief got fired and they made him the chief. So he was chief when he was 23 years old. You think he ever got taught how to write a policy? Do you know, he, does, he, does he know what policies he really needs to write for his agency? He doesn't. So he welcomed our help. He was shocked and overwhelmed at the amount of information we could provide him. Um, your larger agencies, they have very little to change. They do a lot of work already. They put in the efforts. They have the time and the resources to do that. Um, sometimes we have to do small tweaks to get their, stand, their, their policy to meet our standard to certify them. But some of them, we literally write the standard for them. And I, we create sample policies. We put them on our website, and we say, cut and paste them, change the title at the top, and sign it. Issue it today. It's a policy. It'll stand up. OK? So what we do, what Carlson talked about, so these agencies are going to submit their standard. They're going to submit their standard to us. Someone in our staff is going to review what they've proposed to us or they've presented to us. And we're going to ask for compliance or proofs, right? You can say you're doing something in a policy. Show me a proof that you're doing it. And for law enforcement, the easiest way to explain it, I say every year they have to qualify with their handgun, right? So we just don't go, yeah, they all qualified. We write it down on a qualification sheet. That's a proof that they're actually doing what the state mandates they do, right? These are not mandatory standards. Keep that in mind. These are voluntary we're asking these agencies to do it. We're offering them every resource we have available to get them to do it, but we are offer it is not a mandatory thing. Um, we are now at over 500 agencies out of that roughly 900 in Ohio that are involved in some step of this process. Um, we would like to get closer to that 900 number. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but we're not going to quit until we get somewhere near there. Um, it, is a, it is a growing program. Uh, I think Carlton told me one time, he said it was kind of like we, we, were, we were tasked with flying the plane, or we were tasked with building the plane, flying the plane, and landing the plane all at the same time. And that's kind of what it feels like some days. Um, so we've had some bumps in the road. We, t we welcome the feedback from the agencies and from the community. Uh, we make mistakes and we try to fix them. Um, so I think I'll, I'll cut it with this. If you have a law enforcement representative in your community, you know them, obviously you all do, get with them, ask them if they're involved in the collaborative, tell them you heard from us today. It's all free. It is no cost to the agency whatsoever. We offer free peer resources. So we will send an OACP rep or a BSSA rep to the agency. I'll go. I'll drive. I've driven all over this state hundreds of miles in a day to go visit an agency for three or four hours. And I, and I can be there in three or four hours. I can get their policies up to a standard and improve them dramatically. 
Um, so I'd ask you to push it. I mean it when I say it's the most important thing I've seen in Ohio in law enforcement in a very long time. All right, if we can stop, and this is my goal, we may never know, but my goal truly is, if any of you know a law enforcement officer personally, the last thing you want to do is use their weapon at work. So when I think about those, those men who were involved in the shooting of Tamir Rice, um, first of all, thank God every day, I, didn't, I never had to um, harm someone that way. But I came very close to killing a child in a CIT encounter when I was a police officer. And something worked out for me. I used all my training, I followed all the policies I knew, and it worked out. And I'm grateful every single day I didn't have to kill a child. All right? So no policeman goes, gets up uh, every morning and says, man, I can't wait to go kill somebody today. They're not made that way. They're human beings. They have families. They care. They want to go home and be safe. They just want to do their job. So please ask them to reach out to us. I'm going to leave some business cards here. Also, we have a website. It's uh, www.ocjs.ohio.gov. And on the right-hand side of the page is the Ohio Collaborative. And under that, it's, it's being updated constantly. Excuse me. My never stops. Um, it's being updated all the time. All of our information is there. We have standard policies. We have information about the governor. We have information about the collaborative board. Everything that's taking place and communication is there. I just want to mention two things. Um, first, the, that 500 plus agencies, that represents about 80% of the Ohio population and about 80% of all law enforcement officers in Ohio. So uh, that's a good chunk of our state. Obviously, we're working every day to add to that, but uh, we're off to a really good start. And keep in mind, you know, it, it hasn't been that long that we've been engaged in this process. And then the, the last thing is that um, a lot of this work, it's really good work, but what makes it really, really good work is for more people to know about it. And so we've seen agencies make a lot of progress and we want to get the word out to people. So we actually have, um, we actually hired a vendor to uh, run a campaign for us. It's called the Change Starts Here campaign. And it's all about um, things going on in our state. We have some some success stories up about things that agencies have done, and they've done some pretty amazing things. But the, the whole kind of premise behind Change Starts Here is that here is me. Okay, so we all have a role to play in community police relations, right? Because we're all at least one of those. You know, police officers are both community members and a police officer, we're all community members. So I would urge you also, you can go to our website and read all about the change starts here. But I, I just want to kind of echo Ed's comments about urging your local agency to adopt the standards. Um, I know there was an event, I can't remember which community it was, but one of the reporters asked them, are you collaborative certified? And I wouldn't want to be in a position when something bad happens to have to say, no, this completely free process um, that would help me have standards for my agency. I chose not to do that. I also just want to stress that it doesn't mean that we won't have events. It, just, it doesn't mean that. There are legitimate uses of force. And then when I talked about the four parts of the standard that every, uh, that every standard has inside of it, that last one is that when someone steps outside of policy, that the agency takes steps. Well, we've seen that. We saw that very recently where there was a video of an officer doing something that he shouldn't have done and the agency did an investigation and then they took steps because he had stepped outside of the policy. So uh, I think that's all we have. If anyone wants to ask any questions, we're more than happy to answer. I guess I have one question. Yeah. Is this collaborative just in Ohio or is it in other states? It's just in Ohio. We've certainly, we've done presentations all around the country. Um, there are other states who are interested, but uh, they're highly collaborative.